Stephen Sondheim, you are and have been for 40 years one of the great figures, one of the great creative figures of the American musical. You wrote the lyrics for West Side Story and Gypsy, and lyrics and music for shows like Follies, Company, Assassins, Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, and a little night music. These shows tackle an astonishingly wide range of subject matter. What attracts you to a subject? It's very hard to tell. It's, um, most of the shows I've done have been brought to me. I've been dragged kicking and screaming into a couple of them, uh, of which, s some of which turned out extremely well, like Pacific Overtures, which Harold Prince uh, practically forced me to do. But um, uh, I, the ones that have attracted me that I've started myself where I saw a uh, Stratford East production of Sweeney Todd here, the play by Christopher Bond, and I knew I wanted to sing that. And I once read an outline of a proposed musical on uh, various assassins throughout the ages. And though the... Uh, actually, it was, it, was a, it was a small play. Uh, though it uh, was not, I thought, a very good play, the idea of a musical about assassins struck me. And then I saw a movie, uh, 1983, called Passione de More, and that struck me as something. But I think with those three exceptions, uh, either... I've gone to a librettist and said, have you any ideas? Because it's somebody, a playwright I wanted to work with, or I've been asked to do it by other librettists. What struck you about Sweeney Todd or Assassins? Not the form, the content. What was well, it in the content? Well, you appeal? see, uh, it's, not, it's not so much content, it's story. In the case of Sweeney Todd, I just thought it was, I've always wanted to do a Grand Guignol melodrama. And what I loved about Bond's uh, version was that it was funny as well as creepy and scary. Um, it... It, it had a different tone at uh, Stratford East than it did in, uh, eventually in, in the version that I wrote in that it was, uh, it was strictly, a, I guess, what you call a, a pub theater. That is to say, people brought in, you know, steins of beer, and there were, there were kind of street songs in between the scenes. So it had a very rough, informal feeling, uh, which was part of its charm. Um, and, but what struck me as, uh, as uh, remarkable was the amalgam between, of... of um, comedy and uh, melodrama. I'm a big melodrama fan. I like Did you Blood want and Thunder Plots. Do you want to scare the, scare the yeah, audience? I want to scare the audience, yeah. I love being scared in, in movies and plays, and music's the way to do it, and uh, as Jaws proves. I, I, I remember when I sat down and the, and the house lights dimmed in the movie theater and those double basses started and there was just a shot of water. I was terrified. Nothing had happened. Nothing happened. It was a, a, what music can suggest. And um, I've always been a, a big fan of Bernard Herrmann's film scores. And again, you know, you take most of those Hitchcock pictures and you take the Herrmann score out, they're not anywhere near as tense or frightening as they are with his music. He really knew how to, how to uh, um, um, screw the suspense tight. Are there subjects that couldn't be the subject of a musical, that are unsuited for musical? Yes, one of them is murder mysteries. Uh, the whole idea of a mystery is that uh, that there's an explanation at the end, this is a, as opposed to melodramas or thrillers, which I think uh, work very well with music. But um, people have tried to do murder mysteries. Um, there was one that had certain moderate success on Broadway called Redhead. And uh, as with farce, everything works to a certain point all right with music, but then when either the farce or the expl explanatory part of the murder mystery uh, takes over. You simply can't sing. You cannot sing the climax of a of a, an Agatha Christie novel with any uh, grace. I think I mean, anything can be sung, obviously, but I don't think it would be very satisfactory to have Hercule Poirot uh, explain in the twenty minute aria how the maid was disguised as the butler. You know. But I was really asking whether there were subjects which ruled themselves out for the theatre on grounds of taste. I mean, assassins, for example, a series of attempts to assassinate American presidents. Well, but Is that you, a suitable subject for me? Well, I, th I don't think there's such a thing as suitable or unsuitable. I, th I think the theatre can, uh, can uh, encompass anything. The thing about uh, assassins that immediately strikes me is, quite, uh, is how suitable they are because they are the subject of folk material, aren't they? Um, the way uh, Western heroes are the subject of folk song or the way uh, uh, any backwoods or prairie stories or any kind of historical myth. And there's something mythical about assassins. It struck me right away when I, I, I just... I, uh, this, this play that I referred to, all I saw was the title. I didn't even open the play. I just saw the title. If somebody had written something called Assassins, I thought, oh, what an idea for a musical. And uh, when I gave it to John Wyman um, many, many, many years later as an idea, 
because it was an idea that was in the back of my head all those years, and I never pursued it. Uh, and uh, when I went to the librettist, John Wyman, who wrote Pacific Overtures, and I said, he wanted to do a historical subject because he's very into American history. And I said, I once came across something. I said, I just saw the title, Assassins, and I saw his eyes turn into pinwheels. He had exactly the same reaction I did. He said, I don't know why, but that's a wonderful idea for a musical. I said, it sings to me, too, and I don't know why. And it isn't being perversely grotesque. It's, there's a folk material aspect. The fact that these events actually took place has nothing to do with the fact that uh, uh, they're still subject to folk, folklore. They're, in fact, doing the research. There were many, many songs of the period written about assassins like Guiteau and Booth and um, because the events are so much larger than life. In one of your songs, the guy sings, I never do anything twice. Is the that girl. A, is that the girl sing? Is that a motto for you? <laughs> no, yeah, yes. I generally like to, um, to skip around from, from subject to subject. And Isaiah Berlin divided the world into foxes and hedgehogs, and I'm a fox. Exploring many, 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 many. The, f- the hedgehog and, knows one big thing, big, and the fox and, knows many things. Right. Right. And uh, and uh, I, I like to explore many things. Um, uh, the metaphor doesn't exactly apply, but it's. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I, I would get bored. I think doing something the second time. I, I know I do. In fact, well, it's quite often after Gypsy. I remember everybody was shoving backstage uh, musicals at me, and I thought, no, but I've just done that before you arrived on it, on the scene, as it were, the American musical was very big on emotion and sentiment. Your texts rather undercut uh, love as the subject of, of the musical. Passion. I just got through doing a show called Passion. It's about nothing but... It took you a long time to get round to it, though. Well, no, you know, you, I think you have to be careful about uh, the difference between sentiment and sentimentality, and I think you may be referring to sentimentality. Uh, I think there's a great deal of sentiment in most of the stuff I write. Um, and, um, you know, I have this reputation for writing cerebral musicals, but I think it's, it's about... I'm, I'm very fond of irony, and I'm, I, I'm, I have a fairly... Uh, irony undercuts sentiment, That's right, it? Yeah. right. And, it's, and I really am not into treacle. And um, I think what you're referring to is the treacle aspect of the, of the American musical and, and even the British musical. Before your time the American musical was very big on narrative. It was telling a big story. You are less keen on narrative. No, I sometimes am and sometimes I'm not. I can't think of a stronger narrative than Sweeney Todd and uh, the narrative Merrily Roll Along. But I do like to experiment in that twilight area between review and um, what you'd call narrative uh, line. Company being the first um, commercial musical that I know of that was halfway between there had been reviews and there had been what we call book shows but nobody had ever taken a moment which is what companies about a single moment in a man's life literally one maybe three seconds in which something snaps inside of his head and he reviews his life to that moment on 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 one level on, on the level of commitment of emotional commitment and makes a decision and so the musical in that sense takes place within a two or three second span um, the business of exploding a moment like that, the business of a, a group of memories forming your, your uh, story as opposed to a plot, as in Follies. Those interest me. On the other hand, Night Music is a narrative musical. Uh, uh, Merrily is, Sweeney Todd is, um, uh, Into the Woods is. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to do Into the Woods is I wanted to do a fairy tale. I wanted to tell that uh, Wizard of Oz narrative. But uh, Company and Follies have put together in a sort of filmic way. That's Have you right. learned from film? Yes, I was a movie buff as a kid. As a matter of fact, when I was in my early 20s, we had something called the $64,000 question, a, a quiz show in the United States, and I, I was up for, for movies, and I passed the test, and I was ready to go on, and then it was canceled at the last minute. But I was, I've always been a movie buff, and um, I'm very, very into film technique and the application of it to the stage. You might have got to take a bribe if you... Ah, had, yes, I've, I've, I've I've become missed, I missed my opportunity and been the subject of a movie. Once you've got the idea for the piece and you're writing, which comes first, the lyric or the music? Both at the same time. Oh, what, what, really? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I work in tandem. Um, yeah, there's a danger of boxing yourself in if you, if you develop a tune and then you have to shoehorn... It's hard enough to write lyrics when you have freedom, but when you have to really shoehorn it in and try to make it smooth and effortless it 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 it's uh, you have to be careful not to paint yourself into a corner but more than that 
when I once having I do a great deal of discussion with the librettist many weeks and determine what the function of song in the piece is whether now, song the is librettist necessary. is writing the book yes right right and but uh, but we we poach on each other's territory in the sense that there's a constant uh, uh, free flow of ideas back and forth and we discuss what the function of song should be and then start to make an outline and once we've done the outline I like the librettist to go off and write a little bit so he so I can tell what the style of the way people talk. I mean, I know the characters, but I, until I hear them talk, which is the librettist's ear at work, uh, I, I don't have anything to imitate, and I'm a very good mimic, and that, that's essentially what I do with the tone of lyrics, unless they're the kind of um, you know, comment lyrics, as in Company or Assassins, where there's an outside tone, where the, where the songs do not um, grow in t- integrally out of the character, but are the author's comment. I'm, I'm avoiding the use of the word Brechtian, which is a word I hate, but there it is. It's the Brechtian use of song. Um, and then I, I find uh, musical atmospheres as important as lyric atmosphere, and so I try to develop accompaniment figures and harmonic sequences before even attacking the melodic line. Uh, at the same time, I'm jotting down um, lyric phrases, uh, sometimes refrain ideas, that is to say ideas that one keeps coming back to a, a given line or a, or a, or a, or a phrase or a, even a word, uh, and developing lists of associative ideas for, for the lyric and also trying to outline where the lyric is going, what the beginning is going to be, what the end is. Sometimes I write it out in prose. Sometimes I take a couple of pages of the librettist's scene and literally prop them up on the piano and work at the piano. I try as I get older, to work less and less at the piano because you get um, hemmed in by, by, your own, by the dexterity or lack of it of your fingers. And also muscle memory plays an, an unfortunately important part. If you've been f- playing a chord for a number of years, your, t- your hands tend to play that same chord. I, so I, I try to write in different keys to force myself to. Uh, but I, uh, mo- most important, uh, I try to write away from the piano and, and hear Sitting the music. Sitting down, standing up, lying walking down. around. I'm a li- I'm a, I strictly yeah. lie down. How can lie you down, write lying down? Uh, because it's easy to fall asleep. Actually, I do that less than I used to, but I got in the habit of doing it. No, I, one of the reasons I have bad posture is for many, many years of hunched over piano and lying down with a, a pad propped on my knees. But habits die hard, as you, as you must know, and um, you know, even the kinds of pencils and pads I use die. You know, I have to use the same ones over and over again. Does it. art come easy to you? Well, if, by art, if you mean creative activity, yes. Yes, it does. Um, when I'm dealing with, when I know the subject, when I know the, the play or the librettist's ideas or whatever, yes, I love inventing. The hard part is the execution, obviously. But uh, even that's fun, the working out. Uh, when I say fun, of course, I'm talking about agonizing fun. I'm not talking about pleasant fun. But um, certainly, yeah, I love to invent. Do musicals get written or rewritten? Well, musicals, uh, uh, musicals get rewritten more than plays do, probably, because they are presentational forms of theater. Uh, plays are essentially what goes on between the characters on the stage. But in a musical, even in an intense... Uh, personal one like passion, the the the, uh, uh, the force has to come over the footlights and into the audience. It is presentational. There is a certain amount of ta-da, even in the most serious work, as you know yourself, from opera. You know, uh, no matter how intense the emotion, the communication is there primarily. That means that the audience response is your final collaboration. And until you get your musical in front of an audience, it's not a complete work. I think that's not true of a play. I do think a play must be on the stage. It must not just be on the page. But I don't think it needs the audience as much as a musical does. I think, I think you have to do that. A couple of years ago, you were offered a medal for your creative achievement oh. by the National Endowment for the Arts. And you turned it down. Why did you do that? Oh, well, because, in, uh, you know, the state of the arts in, in America is unfortunate. I mean, the, uh, it is uh, the sense of the country and certainly of, of, of uh, prior to Clinton of the government and certainly of the Republicans is very anti-art. And um, this was a Republican presidency and the cutting down of the, of the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, which is still going on. Uh, appalled me, and um, the subject of censorship of the arts appalled me, and I just thought I can't... Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make a big stand about it. It's just I couldn't in all conscience accept. 
Stephen Sondheim, where were you born? I was born in New York City in the middle of Manhattan. I've lived uh, my whole life in what amounts to 20 square blocks uh, because uh, there's a part of Central Park that comes into it, but I can bound my life in Manhattan by four locations. And it's strictly midtown Manhattan. I now, I now also live in the country, and that's, but that's only in the last 10, 12 years. Who was your father? My father was named Herbert Sondheim. He was a, uh, a dress manufacturer, an executive. He uh, uh, had his own firm of uh, uh, middle, what they call middle price dresses in, in those days. Um, and maybe they still do. In other words, it's not high couture. It was what's, what's known as 7th Avenue. And I grew up in 7th Avenue. My mother was a designer, a dress designer, and designed for my father. And when they d- divorced, she, he went on and uh, still as a manufacturer, and she became an interior decorator. First, she continued designing. What sort of man was he? Um, he was uh, he was uh, he was one of the few men in the dress business that everybody liked. The dress business is notoriously cutthroat and bitchy, and um, my father was much liked, uh, which actually, ironically, did not um, bode well for his business because he was the kind of man who would keep eighty-six-year-old cutters on the payroll. And uh, it would hurt the production line, but he could not let them go. He was in no way ruthless. And uh, unfortunately, it, uh, he had to retire before his time, I think, because the business uh, went virtually bankrupt. What sort of woman was your mother? My mother was, a, was a, a, a something of a monster. She was um, an extremely selfish, and uh, her values were entirely uh, material. Money and celebrities are what, what interested her. And she did not want to have children, and I, I was an only child, and I think I, I think it was an accident. And um, uh, she was a career woman, and uh, she, uh, when my father left her, uh, she took her anger out on me because I was, you know, she had to have somebody to to, to uh, do. So I, I, from the age of ten to fifteen, I lived with her because she had custody of me, and the, it was an ugly divorce, and it was a, a hellish part of my life, and. Um, uh, she had told me that um, uh, I could never see my father and my stepmother without, or else they'd be thrown in jail, which, of course, was a lie. But at the age of 11, you believe what you're told. And when I found out it wasn't true, I left her at the age of 15. I went and off and lived with my father. But my life was saved by um, the family of Oscar Hammerstein and his wife. who were, My mother was collecting celebrities, and um, they had a son my own age. And... Um, so I was sort of osmosed into the Hammerstein household, and they became my surrogate parents and saved, emotionally saved my life. Just before I ask you about Oscar Hammerstein, what about school? You went to a military school? Yes, well, <coughs> that was, uh, that was sort was of... a nice I, Jewish boy like you doing in a military school? Uh, with a lot of other nice Jewish boys. There were, I, uh, 90% of the, of the student body was either Jewish or Italian, and um, uh, many of them were children of, of broken homes, um, uh, there was a kind of myth that if if your, if your family broke up, what you needed was discipline. So you were sent to military school. The again, the surprise. Did you need discipline? I don't think so, but I loved it. Uh, I, the, everything was so chaotic at home that to be told to be at a certain place at nine twelve and another place at nine thirty seven and to have to go on parade and that sort of thing. Again, I was ten and eleven years old. We had little wooden rifles, but it was called New York Military Academy. It's sort of the, the little brother of West Point. And I, I thrived. I thought it was terrific. And also, Good it was away music- from home. <laughs> Good subject for a musical? Mm, I don't know what, what the story is yet. You'd have to tell me what the story is. Uh, but uh, When did... Yeah. No, I was just going to say, you could take just so many marches. When did music enter your life? How did it enter your life? It's interesting. I was, when I was six or seven, uh, like, again, nice middle-class Jewish boys, I was given piano lessons and then trotted out at uh, cocktail time, meaning after, after school hours, to play for the company that would come in and before they'd all go out to dinner. And, um, and I remember playing Fly to the Bumblebee and things like that. And I was, you know, moderately agile. But uh, that only lasted two years. And then when I went to military school, they had a gigantic uh, four-tier organ there. And I love gadgets. And when I saw these four manuals with pink and green and blue buttons and all the different stops. I could, my feet could hardly hit the pedals, but I just adored it. So I took a year of organ there. And then um, falling, in, then it, it disappeared. But then when I fell in with the Hammerstein family, I wanted to be like Oscar. So I wanted to be a songwriter suddenly. And so when I got to the equivalent of high school or what we call prep school over there, I went to a Quaker school. Um, I started to take music again. And you sent him a musical that you'd written. Oh, yes, yeah, the, the legendary one. I was 15, I sent him a musical thinking that, uh, which was all about, I went to a school called George School, and it was called By George, get it? And uh, it was all about the student body.
everybody in the faculty. And I really thought that Roger and Hammerstein were going to produce it on Broadway, and I'd be the first teenager. And he, he, uh, I asked him to treat it as if, um, as if it had just crossed his desk, as if he didn't know me. And he said, all right, in that case, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dreadful musical, and I'll tell you why. And then he proceeded. It's one of those afternoons, I've often thought of it as like um, uh, uh, Alice Liddell's a- afternoon. It w- changed my life. And um, he taught me so much that afternoon that still, it still manifests itself. Uh, you said of Into the Woods that the whole show is about what's passed down to us by our parents. What was, oh. what was passed down to you by your parents? Well, by Oscar is what, I'm, what, I, what I think of. I don't think much was passed down by my parents to me except a good deal of service. Uh, it was, um, uh, I, I liked my father very much, uh, but he was one of those fathers who's no good until you're of a rational age, in other words, which was also true, incidentally, of Oscar Hammerstein. He was much less good of a father to his own children than he was to me. Uh, my, my father, like Oscar, was very good when you were 15 or 16 years old and onwards. But before that, they were baffled, I think. And uh, it, uh, so I can't say I got much from them, but I got a great deal from Oscar and Dorothy. You write music and words. When did your fascination with words begin? Uh, with Oscar. He introduced me to something called puns and anagrams, which is a crossword puzzle in um, the New York Times. We never had cryptic puzzles the way you have over here. We had, in fact... Um, uh, up until uh, I wrote some puzzles for a magazine called New York Magazine. There was only one cryptic puzzle in the United States, which was in a, in a publication that didn't have a large circulation called The Nation. But every third Sunday in the New York Times, there'd be a little crossword puzzle with puns and anagrams, a very, very primitive version of a cryptic puzzle. And Oscar got me interested in that, and I, that started to get me interested in words as formations of letters and, you know, where words, seeing words in a different way, as divorced from their meanings, but as, you know, as anagrams or as... Uh, uh, that sort of thing, and that's how I got interested in language. But mostly, it was imitate. I, wa- I wanted to be Oscar. I've said, and, and granted, it's a, a hyperbole, but I've said that uh, if Oscar were a geologist, I would have become a geologist. In this country, if you say the importance of being Oscar, people think you're talking about Oscar Wilde. Well, that's it's right, Oscar <laughs> Hammerstein for you. But are words for expressing meanings and feelings, or are they for playing with? Well, they're both, of course. They're both, and. Uh, wa- one of the few delights of lyric writing is to be able to combine the two, to uh, use the words as meaning, but to be playful with them. You know, the, the, I, the English language is just a miracle to me. I just adore it. And um, uh, the business of being able to, to, to use words not just for their meanings, but for their sonic variations, for the pun aspects, for the, the so-called plays. Where, where at now, there's the whole other crossword puzzle version, which has nothing to do with communication, as far as I'm concerned. That's strictly a game and has to do with the joys of the roots of the language, you know, really, you know, when you, when you really start looking at, at, uh, at uh, word origins and, and how words are formed and that sort of thing. It, uh, how connects. did you get into musical theatre? Well, get into, I wrote this show when I was 15, really, is what it was, into the profession. When I was 17, Oscar hired me as a, what we call a gopher. I uh, mean, you go for coffee and you go for... And as his assistant on a show he wrote called Allegro, which was his third show after Oklahoma and Carousel, and which had the distinction of being his first flop. And it was very good for me to be around a flop because to watch a group of professionals put a show together that didn't work for either audience or critics is very valuable. And um, because it, it wasn't a flop because of amateurism, it was a flop because the ideas that Oscar wanted to convey did not convey to an audience because the, the execution was nowhere near up to the ambition. The show was brilliantly, wonderfully ambitious. Uh, uh, it, 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 it really was the forerunner of the kind of fluid cinematic staging that was made popular by his next show, which was South Pacific, which was the first show that really was successful that used cinematic staging. But that's interesting because all of your shows in different ways have been ambitious and some of them have been flops. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think I picked. You know, it's only recently that I that I've realized. I think I picked up ambition for the musical theater from Oscar. I didn't realize that. I thought what I picked up from him mostly was technique and and tone and and honesty and uh, striving for simplicity and for effortlessness. I thought I picked up all those technical things, but I think I picked up from him his ambitions for the stage. And I think it was because of Allegro. I mean, Oklahoma and Carousel, I was really too young to appreciate how they'd broken the mold because I'd had no history of musical theater, and I was, you know, 12, 13 years old. 
Uh, so I didn't know what he was fighting against or what he was revolutionizing, I should say. But by the time I was 17 and, and Allegro came along, I knew what he was doing and that he was experimenting with... A, 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 he, he was the first person, maybe the only one, who used a Greek chorus as a chorus. He put the two together, which seems obvious now, but the idea of using the commentary Greek chorus, but they are the singing chorus of, of the musical, is, you know, quite astonishing. Is there something of that in A Little Night Music? Yes, mm -hmm. there is indeed. Was writing the lyrics for West Side Story your first big break? You, it was the first professional break. Actually, I'd written a show before that that was supposed to go on called Saturday Night, and the producer, we were in the process of raising money. It was produced by the man who produced Kiss Me Kate, our leading set designer at the time, named Lemuel Ayers. And he died at uh, a tragically young age of leukemia, and I didn't know he had it, but it was while he was trying to produce it. So the show never got on, but it was my first professional score, that is, say, a set of songs that I could then play for professionals. And it was as a result of that that Arthur Lawrence heard me, and that's how I got the job on West Side Story, Arthur Lawrence being the librettist of West Side. How many people does it take to write a musical? Some Sounds musicals... like a Polish joke. What? How many people does it take to screw in the light bulb? Well, yeah. is, it, is it three, books, lyric, and music, or is it two? Well, it depends. It one man do the whole thing? Well, there are people, woman. you know, there are, uh, there are people like Noel Coward who did the whole thing, and then there are songwriters like uh, me and, and Irving Berlin and many others, who, uh, a few others who do both music and lyrics, Frank Lesser. I, I, I'm a collaborative animal. I love to collaborate. I would you never write do it. Lyrics and music yeah, yourself. But I want to. I will, but always with a librettist. Always with a librettist. Okay, and okay. I've written a couple of murder mysteries, but always with a collaborator. Is the American musical an art form uh, invented and developed by Jews? Is that significant? Mm. Yes, I think so. I think so. Uh, the, the, it comes from the vaudeville tradition when uh, Jews first um, uh, immigrated. Uh, there were really two avenues open to them. Uh, this is the early part of the century. There was the entertainment industry and the garment industry, which is why uh, Hollywood as we know it, all those studios were run by Jews, and, um, and why the dress business is, was dominated by Jews. Well, part of the entertainment industry was the theater, though, of course, the theater had such eminent non-Jews as George M. Cohen, but it was a place where they were accepted, and um, it is true that most of the songwriters of the so-called golden era of American musicals, and in fact most of them today, are Jewish. Did you set out consciously to change the form of the American music? No, absolutely not. I, I'm, I'm a classicist and a conservative in the sense that I believe that content dictates form. But if your content is assassins, then of course the form is going to come out um, non-traditionally, isn't it? Uh, and uh, no, I never, never do it. And and in fact, when when I when I write a show like um, uh, oh, "Merrily We Roll Along," which, although it goes backwards, but it's based on a play that goes backwards, it's an absolutely traditional uh, a treatment, as is "Into the Woods." It's, they're totally traditional. The story lines themselves may have their oddities, but I never, no, ne never consciously do it. I think if you do that, you become arch, and uh, in 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 the self consciousness, I think you take the life out of a work. How do you get original inventive work on on Broadway, and how does it succeed on Broadway? Broadway is a kind of roller coaster of success, isn't it? Well, it, yes, it is, and nowadays, of course, there's almost no uh, invention, and uh, everything has to be either pre-tested in England or uh, pre-tested in regional theaters. There's almost no original work done on Broadway, or it's based on big hit movies, um, because shows are so expensive. Um, it's very hard for young writers to get work on Broadway. The only advantage young writers have today that they didn't have when I was young was that uh, there was no such thing as off-Broadway when I grew up. And you either got your show on Broadway or you didn't get it on. At least now, you can write a show and get it done in many, many regional theaters, off-Broadway houses, etc., etc. And though you can't make a living out of such a small audience, if somebody takes up the show as, for example, a show called Big River, which is a big hit on Broadway, but which starred in a regional theater, or if you write something that opened in a 100-seat house over 30 years ago, The Fantastics, and it plays all over the world in small productions, you can make a very handsome living, and the whole idea of making a living is so that you can afford to write another show and try to get it on. Is your work received differently here in Britain than it is in, in New York? It has been generally, with one exception. Sweeney Todd, which I really wrote as a love letter to London, was, was trounced on by the critics over here when it was first done, and I think maybe it's because they felt that uh, Americans were poaching on one of their national myths, 
But indeed, uh, my first good reviews ever, because I, I got I got panned for West Side Story, I got panned for Gypsy, I got panned for Funny Thing I'm Doing the Forum until I got to Britain. My first good reviews were for the British production of Forum, and I I put that down to the British love of language because Forum is full of playful, playful lyrics, and people over here tend to in those days tended to listen more to lyrics than they ever did in the United States. Curious enough, it was the rock and pop revolution that made audiences more aware of lyrics. And so when Forum was revived 15 years later in, uh, in the United States, people started to listen, to, were listening to the lyrics. And, um, but generally, generally, I've had a better time over here because people listen to language over here. Andrew Lloyd Webber, who's pretty big on Broadway with Cats and Sunset Boulevard, shares a birthday with you. Yes. yes. What do you think of his work? I never discuss anybody's work. Ex ex unless never? Except, never, except dead people. And I'll tell you why. Uh, there's that thing of, uh, there's that old phrase, um, uh, never speak ill of the dead, I paraphrase. Well, it seems to me they're exactly the people you should speak ill of because you can't hurt their feelings. But all of us suffer so terribly for, uh, at the hands of everybody from uh, critics to, uh, you know, uh, audiences even, uh, that I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's not wise to discuss the work of, of your contemporaries. You collected... Games. How many did you have? Gee, I don't know. I had a fire at the house. Uh, my, my house. How did that happen? The fire? Oh, it was, a, it, was a, it was the most prosaic of circumstances. A lamp had an overheated wire. The overheated wire was ran under some cardboard cartons, uh, in which I kept vocal scores. And um, I had a house with a central staircase, and a flame started and acted like a chimney. And within ten minutes, it, the house wasn't destroyed because the fire department got there in time. But that house. But it wasn't destroyed by fire, but it was destroyed partly by fire and by water and, and smoke. You damage. lost all your possessions? No, no, but I lost a lot of the games. I never counted them, and I stopped collecting games years ago. The reason I started collecting games was when I first moved into my first apartment, I had no money to, to buy uh, photo, you know, photographs or drawings or anything like that, whereas uh, games, which are very, very decorative, were $5 and $7 a piece at a, an old bookstore I found downtown, so I hung them up all over the place. What are you going to replace them with? Uh, I don't know, really. Um, probably not, not a lot. I still have some, some games and some pictures, photographs, and posters. I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not a painting collector. Is it true that you've been in analysis for <coughs> 20 years? <laughs> yes, I was in analysis for over 20 years. Um, and um, to help you? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It was, it was great. It was what, great. What, and what? Now I'm still friendly with the analyst, and, and we're, we're now social friends. And he's a wonderful man. What was the problem? Oh, the, well, it wasn't a problem, although it was, it was, it was prompted by a specific uh, um, um, emotional upheaval I was going through. But uh, it was a feeling that, um, of, well, I don't want to say that I wasn't fulfilling a potential, but that I was too frightened uh, to, I think analysis, uh, let me put it this way, I, at the risk of oversimplification, I think analysis is the process of learning to say no. And I was somebody who always said yes. And uh, Does that mean in relationships? Relationships, professional, everything. The desire to be, in, to be uh, uh, liked, the desire to be nice, don't say no to anybody because they will hate you or they will resent you or they will um, be hurt or, 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 or. And that's not a good way to go. And I, I felt that very strongly. And so... That's what he taught me. You feel better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, much better. Much Some better. people claim to have detected a change in your work in passion and point to a new directness and freedom in expressing emotion in it. And no, I wonder whether that might be related to a yeah. change in your private life. Is yeah. that right? Well, no, I don't think it is, although there has been a change in my private life. But I don't think that's what it is. I think that came about with a collab because I changed collaboration from Harold Prince to James Lapine. Lapine, because uh, it starts with Sunny in the Park with George. I mean, you can detect an entire different atmosphere. It's not unlike what happened to Richard Rogers when he went from Larry Hart to Oscar Hammerstein. He went from brittle music to, you know, hard on sleeve music. And there are many people who prefer the brittle to the, to the open, uh, open, you know, carousel Oklahoma sound. And so the same thing happened. It, you, I get very affected by my collaborators. And James Lapine, who is quite a complex man, is nevertheless very open emotionally when he writes. And so I think Sunny in the Park with George and particularly the last 15 minutes, the last 20 minutes of Into the Woods, presage, uh, passion is something I always wanted to do, so I have to 
uh, but but passion I wanted to do in 1983 before big change in my life. So uh, uh, I, th I think it's less related to personal life than to the collaboration. The American theater scene, the New York theater scene, art scene, has been very badly hit by AIDS, with lots mm. of people dying. Is that, is that a difficult climate in which to create, or...? No, I don't think it's any more difficult. I mean, it's a difficult climate in which to live, but, you, but it's not restricted to the art scene. It's just being alive today, you know, surrounded by AIDS, not just in the arts, but all... You know, it's a genuine plague, and... Um, and um, a curse, I mean, but I don't think it's, uh, obviously the arts uh, have attracted uh, a lot of people who've come down with AIDS because, uh, 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 not because, but, and the result is that it's been particularly hard hit, but so have many, many businesses, and they're just not as publicized. You know, when somebody dies of AIDS and it's an actor or a, or a composer or a, or a painter, it gets publicity, but if somebody dies in the insurance business, it doesn't. What ambition have you unfulfilled? Gee, what an odd question. I'm, I'm afraid I would sit here and waste five minutes of airtime while I thought. Uh, I can't think of anything at the moment. I mean, uh, writing is the only thing I think I've ever, uh, ever particularly wanted to do. Uh, I, I flirted with being a performer when I was about 18 years old. Uh, I was a talented actor for about a year and a half in college. I'm very untalented now. I'm, I, I, I act very well when I, when I demonstrate my songs, but otherwise I'm very, very self-conscious. So I don't think there's anything, really. What do you fear most? I suppose death. Or dying, rather. I think it's... The older you get, I, at least I do. I'm, I'm, I think that's what I fear most. You're going to go on working? Oh, yes. Can yeah. you ever envisage not working? It's hard for me because, um, though I'm lazy by nature, lazy in the sense that uh, it, I, I, I'm a slow worker, and so I don't turn out as much, and I can easily not write and just loaf. But, uh, but I then start to feel guilty, whether that's the old Jewish guilt or the work ethic or the puritanical, I don't know. But um, one of the problems with writing for the theater has been, it's been my observation that, uh, virtually all uh, writers of musicals, when they get, particularly the songwriters, when they get to be 50 years old, they stop writing well. And it's because it takes about a generation to go out of fashion. And, you know, with the, the, you know rock is, is the uh, lingua franca of, of sort of uh, uh, the musical, popular musical world these days. But it doesn't lend itself to theater. So, I don't think. And so, I, uh, to telling stories lends itself to another kind of theater, which is a performer's theater and a concert theater. Uh, but I think it's not very useful for telling stories. And uh, therefore, in a way, uh, the kind of stuff I write doesn't go out of fashion because it's never been in fashion. Therefore, I think I'm protected from, from, from uh, becoming uh, superannuated as quickly as, as I might have been if I'd been born a generation earlier. But... Um, I can't tell. At any rate, at the moment, I can still write, and as long as somebody will put on the shows, I'm, I'm very happy.